Welcome to a presentation by the James City County Williamsburg Master Gardener Association. Today's topic, compost. We've got a great presentation uh, this morning. Galen Callahan is uh, the extension agent from Hampton. And she's gonna talk to us today about composting. And Galen, the floor is yours. Okay, awesome. All right, so I'm a three-year homeowner. I have been slowly working on my green thumb skills. And so when I first came here to extension about eight years ago, I was apartment living and I could only really, really talk about vegetable gardening because I had done it before and house plants. But among uh, uh, amongst other things that I have been doing at my home besides, you know, landscaping in the perennial garden, of course, my vegetables, gar gar vegetable garden is going lawn. I am composting and I Want to just expand it. I don't know that my husband agrees with it, but there might be some more compost bins coming soon and he's just going to be surprised. So um, because I, you know, fertilizers cost money, compost costs money. I am not trying to grow the $50 tomato. And also on the flip side, our garbage can fills up quickly because we use up a lot of kitchen, uh, you know, vegetables, fruits. Uh, herbs. We have a lot of kitchen scraps. And so I'm not looking to put all of that in the garbage can because we were, when we first looked at, we were constantly taking the garbage out. We cook just about every day. So that garbage needs to go somewhere. So we've been able to, um, so we were able to reduce the amount of times we were going out, you know, putting garbage in the garbage can just from the kitchen scraps that we had. On the, also, I am getting my brown and I'll uh, talk about that later my carbon source from the amount of spam mail that I get. So all the election flyers, all of the, we like to buy your home or car, the car warranty, that's gets shredded and it goes into the compost bin. As much as I hate it and would just absolutely love for someone to stop cutting down trees for such wasteful material that I never read, it does provide the carbon source to get my compost going. So we're gonna start off have I been hitting the button? I apologize. So what is composting? The benefits, I, I don't see any drawbacks, but we'll definitely talk about the benefits. If you are composting, I hope I can talk you into doing it and how to make it at home, how to use it and what actually happens in that compost pile. So compost is actually a term for organic matter that had that is decomposed into a form that plants can use. And that's from an article by Kelly in uh, 2017, uh, 2007. So it is the controlled decomposition. So decomposition happens naturally. Us as humans, when we go to compost, we are actually controlling how that material decomposes. So it might happen several years in nature because nothing is acting on it. But when I go out and I spin my wheelbarrow, I'm actually incorporating heat. I'm actually incorporating sunlight, air, and all of that. You know, whatever happens to a log in the forest, that may take several, several years to break down. Um, if I'm composting, then I would never put a log in my compost bin. But if I'm composting twigs or something like that, it's going to happen a lot more quickly. And disclaimer, I'm not the best composter, but I can't get some material. Um, compost, you could probably get it within like three months. For me, it takes me all year because as much as I put out kitchen scraps, I'm not necessarily turning my compost bin about the, the three times a week that's needed. It is lucky if it gets it once a week. So I might, it might be every other week that I turn it, but the compost that I made from last year is already out in my garden. It's not much. I put it on my container of uh, fruit. And so they're going to have a lot of nutrients. I hope I get a lot of, um, I hope I get a lot of uh, fruit production out of it. So this speeds up the process. So microbes, they're naturally found in our environment. 
They're found on the surface. There are microbes growing on you on, on the surface of your skin right now. Um, mm -hmm. But they need that warm, moist, aerobic environment in order to thrive. Okay, so again, with the disease triangle, all of that material needs to be available in order for those microbes to actually do something. But in this case, instead of causing a disease, it will break down the material that's in your compost bin. So you need organic materials. It's going to create a dark, rich hummus um, that you can spread out into the garden. And it makes a great soil amendment. Like I said, I wish I had more of it. I'm going to have to buy some. Um, but I don't want to, I don't want to afford it because then I'm going towards the $50 tomato. So this is a good reason why you should compost in your own yard. So it improves soil health, it, it improves soil fertility. Compost has um, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, all those macronutrients, micronutrients, they are there and available for your plants and it continues to break down slowly. So you have to continue adding compost on a year, yearly break, basis because it does decompose. But you should already have another batch going, you know, to replace whatever decomposes down. Uh, it promotes higher yield of crops. Uh, so like I said, I hope I get a lot of figs, a lot of blueberries, and a lot of blackberries this year. We'll see. Um, mm -hmm. Encourages and feeds diverse life in soils. So uh, the, 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 the macroorganisms that are in the soil, they will continue to feed on this product and they will continue to extract more food out of it. And in the case of something like uh, red worms, red wigglers, uh, you know, their, their, their uh, frass or their poop is actually even more nutritious than the compost. And then you're getting that as well. So all kinds of good things. And it makes the soil easier to work with, whether you have clay, you have sand. I've seen a lot of it in Hampton. I'm sure you all have a diversity of soils in your yard, but it helps it um, it helps make it easier to work with. And then you're going to increase so soil porosity and then uh, moisture retention. So again, if you have that sandy soil, mixing in that compost is going to help that water stay there. And also at the same time, if you have clay, it's going to break up that clay a little bit and allow water to drain. But again, you have to keep adding it on a yearly basis because um, life is going to continue to work on it. So another benefit, it, redu it reduces soil surface crusting and promotes water infiltration into the soil rather than running off. Um, and I was just talking to uh, Jenny here about th that huge storm that we had last Thursday. Did y'all actually ride around? Probably you didn't even have to ride around. It's probably in your backyard. I rode around Hampton. I also did healthy Virginia lawns. I was glad I wore waterproof boots, but... It was a good experience because I could actually see where people's drainage was located, where the runoff was actually coming from. Um, but, you know, we're not going to till our lawns that incorporate compost. But in some areas, that will help with the runoff situation. So there are many ion exchange sites in compost. So uh, the exciting world of soil science, you know, that soil has cation exchange um, sites where nutrients can go back and forth, whether how they're bonding, how they're bonding to the roots. Well, you increase that uh, availability of nutrients by adding compost into your soil and buffering capacity. So you can uh, adjust the pH as well. So nutrients are available to the plant. Like I said, you get those macro and micronutrients, and it also protects your pH from um, extremes. So it doesn't happen, you know, in your soil. You should not see your soil pH go from seven to eight or nine, 10, whatever, and vice versa within a year. If, so if something like that happens, you have dumped a lot of soil amendment into your soil. And compost won't, won't help that if you dump a lot, but it can help buffer, but just not, uh, if you're going to dump a soil amendments like that, um, you know, it's not, it's not going to help adjust for that pH or buffer against it, that pH swing. So this is something that I hope never happens again, but this is what happens when you have 
repeated fertilization and tilling. So what does this picture remind you of? Dust bowl. The dust, the dust bowl. Exactly. So this is what happens, the potential, if we keep tilling and over fertilizing our, our uh, grounds, this is what happens. And then the, the soil blows away. Um, I don't expect you to do this on your property. I, I think um, when I run into master gardeners, I believe you are all environmentally conscious about such things. I know um, every time I talk about pesticides, this pitchforks and torches against me with my master gardeners. Um, so uh, this is this is what's going to happen. Um, you, you, you know, we have big machines that just tears up soil structure. Um, we have uh, these large machines that put down tons, by the tons per thousand square foot, fertilizers, pesticides, and farmers are becoming more environmentally conscious about that because gas is going up, fertilizer costs are going up, and they're trying to reduce their rates of all of these processes. Again, trying not to grow the $50 tomato. So you lose that soil structure. And I'm back and forth with this. I, I want to buy a tiller. I, I do. Because uh, till, tilling, compost, and I um, also have uh, some more soil amendments that need to go in after growing potatoes in the same spot for three years. Um, my soil is done, so it needs some help. I, just the thought of tilling that in by hand hurts my back. Just, just the thought. Okay, I haven't even done it yet because I know how it feels. So I'm back and forth between whether I want to want to get a tiller or not. Um, but we'll see what happens. I, I I think it may win out just so I can save my back. But do as I say, not as I do. Um, so then more fertilizer is needed. The soil becomes compacted. You may not see it at the direct surface. But when, let's say, if you get down maybe three, four feet in the soil, um, and around here in Hampton Roads, we start reaching our water table around maybe six feet or less or so, um, but that's going to compact. And I was actually out at our Tidewater A rec our research center in Suffolk, and the NRCS, the um, Natural Resource Conservation Service, they actually dug a pit for us to see five feet in the soil surface. And you can see where the compaction is. At the same time, you could see where cover crops and native grasses were actually penetrating that far down to help break it up. But something like, you know, your, your, your main vegetables, um, your corn crops and things like that, they aren't going to do that. Those are going to be your grasses and cover crops that are actually going down to reach water in the soil, in the uh, water tape. So that soil can become compacted. More watering is going to be needed. Organisms are going to flee if you keep doing this. There was a time where um, I was in the vegetable garden. So we have a demo bed at Blue Gap Farm. And I help with the vegetable garden. And at some point, I didn't see any earthworms whatsoever, okay? And so I became a little concerned. But when the master gardener I was working with and I at the time, you know, started just removing some of the um, synthetic uh, pesticides and the synthetic um, fertilizers that we're using, just putting down compost from our bin area in the back, it came back. So um, the last thing I want to do is kill earthworms because they're great tillers, they're great aerators. Um, so I wanted to bring uh, other animals back to the area. And then salts build up on soil. Um, it, I equate it to if you ever had a house plant and it had that salty crust on the sides there, similar, similar uh, effect. That salty crust is no good. Um, you're increasing... Uh, you know, pH or decreasing sometimes. Um, and you're also affecting the amount of salt levels in your soil as well, because that will go back. Salt is no good for plants. Well, a lot of plants, some plants are salt tolerant, but the general plants that we grow, they're not going to do well in salty soils. All right, so this is a picture. I know everyone loves the mold, but I tried... I try to see the positive 
aspect from them and that they do aerate the soil sometimes a little too well, but they do aerate the soil, okay? But we have all this life going on in our yards. And we just, we just might see our lawn, we might see our trees, our landscape plants, but there's so much going on in the soil surface, underneath the soil surface there. And ever since I've made contact with my master gardeners, some of you all have, um, I say, raised me as an extension agent to just back off on what I'm putting in my inputs as far as synthetic fertilizers and um, pesticides. I see a whole lot of life happening in my garden and I try to let it work in a balance. Sometimes I might, yeah, I got neem oil, BT, uh, spinosad. I got all of that on hand in case things get out of whack. But there's just so much going on. I want to promote it. It's getting a little too much for me. My husband, you know, got into birding and put up uh, bird uh, bird houses. So the, we have all kinds of wildlife in my backyard and I don't, I don't necessarily want it there, but it is happening. I'm trying to, I'm trying to do, have a positive of approach about why the snake is in my backyard. That's after the moles. That's after the um, the field mice. They they like the bird houses. The possum is there, and I'm just sitting up there, just trying not to be scared of my garden. Um, but at the same time, in the back of my head, I know I have an ecosystem going going on in my in my yard and I'm not trying to mess that up because I also have skinks. They're good for insect control. And if I throw everything out of balance, if I take one piece of the puzzle out, I'm, I'm gonna mess it up. Okay, so I, I'm I'm trying, you know, I'm a city girl. So the you know possums and the snakes and the field mice and voles and moles, all of this is not meshing well with my little city girl heart. But I'm trying to come to terms with it. Yes. So the organisms that we have, we have bacteria, fun, fungi, um, antinomyces, protozoa, rotifers, macroorganisms that you don't need a microscope to see, such as, you know, the voles and moles. So bacteria are going to make up the majority of the um, life that is acting on a compost, uh, that's acting in your compost bin. Um, and they're also going to do the most work. You don't see it, but they're breaking down that material. Fungi or fungi, some people are starting to say is fungi. Um, they consist of molds and yeast. They're going to break down that tougher material. As, as tenomycetes, I keep uh, getting that word wrong, but I'm, I'm trying. Um, they will degrade through materials such as cellulose, um, you know, wood, uh, lignin, chitin. Um, chitin is uh, the backbone of the exoskeleton of insects. They will break that down. And any kind of proteins found in uh, uh, bark, woody stems, paper. Protozoa and rotifers, they play a minor role, but they are still there. Um, they're found in the water droplets um, that, you, that may come from rain or whatnot. And they will consume organic matter as well. And so these are the guys that I like. Sometimes I'll um, vermicompost, red, red, red wigglers. Um, you don't want to use earthworms. They really don't break down um, organic matter like a red wiggler would. So you can go to your, um, I get mine from the uh, bait shop. I'm an angler, so I pick up some for myself and I pick up some for the garden when I'm there. And they do the absolute best. That material is just absolutely wonderful that they make. So red wigglers, So they're going to travel through the soil. They'll eat as they go. And as they're tunneling, they'll produce some frass or um, poo. And you can use that material. It's, I, don't, I, I would have to look at the research to see, say which one is better. But I've had good results with both compost and vermicomp or compost from uh, red wigglers as well. But they are great aerators. They'll bring in air into that compost pile. Um, those roots, when you put it down into your garden, roots will grow through that so that they can get nutrients, they can get water, they have all that access to it. Water can go through, through, through the tunnels. And, you know, it's not bad to have them in your yard in general as well. Um, earthworms are already there, so you don't need to purchase ore on top of that. But if you do, they're good as well. 
and they're earth movers. They'll till the top six to eight inches of soil for you. Okay, so you don't need to do to do the work. Just let just let nature do its thing. So ants, I've been battling with ants. They are in my compost bin, but I I don't care for them getting into my house. So they've got to go. But they eat they eat fun fungi. They eat seeds. They eat. Uh, they're attracted to sweet. Um, you know, honeydew, um, and they're attracted to, they'll eat insects as well. They will also bring in fungi and bacteria from their nest into the compost bin. So just because you see them in the compost bin, um, it's, it's no reason to go ahead and, and start chemical warfare with them. Um, they're actually doing a service to your compost bin and they can make it richer by adding phosphorus and potassium when they're moving those minerals around. Um, same thing with the earthworms. As they're mixing and churning, all of that stuff is getting naturally mixed up. But at the same time, you still need to rotate and cause a big stir in that compost pile in order for that whole system to come back in balance. So millipedes are fine. I get millipedes in my compost bin and uh, not centipedes, but millipedes, definitely. They'll help break down plant material. They'll eat the soft, decaying vegetation. Um, and of course, these are the ones that'll roll up if they're in danger. The ones that you have to watch out for, while they're good for the compost bin, they will bite you. So just, just let them feed in peace. Um, they're fine. And they'll feed on any um, invertebrates that are in there. And that'll break down as well into the compost material. So bugs, uh, they are first level consumers. They'll feed on any kind of rotting wood that's in there. So it's okay for them to be in there. You will see a lot of insects in your compost pile. Um, there's no reason to raise the alarm and, and start treating your compost pile. They are supposed to be there. Uh, snails and even snails and slugs. Now, if you do see them, make sure they're out before you put them in their garden because they will destroy your garden. But they are there to break down material as well. Spiders, um, they'll feed on insects and small invertebrates and they'll help control garden pests. So you might have a whole little battle going on between those spiders and the slugs there. You never know. But they are supposed to be there. Like if you have too many spiders or something, you may want to check to see if there are too many insect pests in your um, in your uh, compost bin because it is not a. I don't know how they get in. It's not exactly like it's a closed system, but it never fails that I'll open up that compost bin and a lot of flies just fly up in my face. Now they shouldn't be there, but it never fails. Even it's been. It's been a warm, it's been a mild winter. Um, they were still in there, just, just a few little gnats, little flies. You open it up, um, they will be there. And I have one of those plastic um, rolling ones that you, um, that you can purchase. It went on sale on Amazon, so I bought it. Um, I don't expect if you have a pile that you use a pitchfork with, I don't expect for you to have a whole lot of flies in there, but something where it's closed, it's nice, dark, it stays moist. Uh, the rainfall can seep in and it just stays moist. Um, you can expect some flies to fly up in your face um, if you get one of those. So I can't really say that I recommend those at this point, but it's, it's working okay for us. We get compost. I just don't care for how wet my compost uh, stays at this point. Um, it, it is never dry. So bad microorganisms. So flies, you don't want them in there. They carry bacteria, viruses. They like to land on fecal matter. Um, we, we don't want any of that into our compost bin. You do want to keep a layer of brown or carbon material on top of the pile. That'll help keep them away from the um, dead, rotting, decaying material that is deep down into your compost bin. So you want to keep that layer of brown, whether it's cardboard, shredded paper, you want to keep that on top of there and bury your food scraps uh, below there. So thermophilic temperatures will kill fly larvae. And uh, mites also help to keep fly larvae in um, reduced levels as well. And thermophilic means it's just very hot. So this was my entrance into 
composting. My husband's like, well, we, we just use, you know, the, the, the totes from the store. Okay, cool. Let's do it. Obviously not enough green or, um, no, I'm sorry, more than enough green material, not enough brown material that I had on top. Lesson learned because all kind of things got into this compost bin. It wasn't pretty, but once I got the hang of it and started understanding that I needed a certain ratio of brown to green material, everything has been coming together. So you can do this in totes. Make sure that you put some drainage holes at the bottom. That's not pretty as well. The uh, the, the, the amount of uh, water that's gunky and filled with uh, rotting tomato juice and pineapple juice and all that stuff. This is city girl thing. Yes, it's not pretty. It's not pretty. So your green materials, these are your nitrogen materials. So anything like coffee brown, coffee grounds, tea bags, flowers, uh, fresh leaves, vegetable fruit waste, grass clippings, as long as it's not treated with an herbicide, can go in there. Uh, manure, yard trimmings, all of that can contribute to your green or nitrogen sources. Brown material, these are your carbon materials. So anything like clipped brush, make sure you want to chop it down so that there are more surface, there's more surface area for the microorganisms to act on. So, you know, the larger the log, you know, you only have the surface and the two sides there. When you start chopping that in half, you get more surface area for that, for those microorganisms to act on. So dry leaves, um, eggshells, and I have a ton of dry leaves. You'd be surprised when you actually start, if, if you collect leaves, just how many bags, well, plastic bags at that, of leaves that are out on your neighbor's property. So I'm able to get my mulch, not only my mulch, but also my um, brown material, just riding around Portsmouth, um, just collecting bags. People, I see, I see people look up out their blinds, like, "What is she doing?" I'm just collecting bags, um, and I have those bags currently in my yard. So um, that's free mulch, free brown material. You gotta watch out for um, a lot of people put, uh, but dealing a lot with making sure that there's no Bermuda grass in there um, because you're not going to break down that rhizome or stolon 100%. So if you throw that into your yard, congratulations, you have Bermuda grass. Because it's going to reroute. Um, so make sure when you when you do that, if you do collect off the side, just make sure there are no um, weeds or seed heads in there or um, warm season grasses that could create a problem in your yard. Um, any kind of spoiled uh, food on napkins, you don't want grease, however, paper towel. So if you just wipe your hands dry with paper towel, that can go into the compost bin. You don't want to take the paper towel you held your pizza in, okay? Something without grease. Sawdust, straw, wood ash, uh, wood chips. I also, like I said, I use mail um, that I shred. You do not want to put these items into your compost bin. So something like bones, you don't want to put in cat or dog manure. They really don't eat a, um, a diet compared to their ancestors, like lions and um, tigers. tigers and bears. There you go. Um, or, you know, um, their wolf ancestors. They're not eating that kind of diet. We're, we're usually getting like a, um, something in pellets that they eat and it's really not nutritious. You'd be surprised just how long um, cat and dog manure lasts. If you just leave it in your soil, it just stays there for a very long time. It really doesn't break down. Any kind of dairy, um, eggs, fats, oils, meats, these attract things to your yard. Um, you don't want mice, you don't want bear. I'm not sure if bear, yes, okay. City girl things. Um, bear, you don't want bear attracted to your compost bin because the city is not going to like, your neighbors are not going to like that. So in order to um, reduce contact with any kind of those animals, just keep it out of your soil, um, your own compost bin. Um, any kind of disease or inf infested uh, plant material, you don't want to put that into your compost bin. Sounds like a, a, a factory 
could get a compost bin to the temperatures high enough in order to kill off that material. You as a homeowner, um, you're not gonna have that, that kind of, of that heat in order to do that. When you turn it, that'll generate heat, but it'll never be high enough in order to kill off seeds, kill off diseases, um, kill off rhizomes, stolons. It's not gonna be high enough. So you wanna keep it out of your compost bin. Good story. Um, I put down my compost back in early March and I have had tomatoes, cucumbers, squash, and peppers growing from that compost pile. And the beauty about it is they've been taking these overnight temperatures, so they're hardy. And I'm just waiting for them to get a little bit bigger, and they're going in the ground mid-April, okay? So, I mean, there's a benefit for you if, if you like. I don't know what kind of species or variety I'm getting, but they're going in the ground. It's the grocery store variety. <laughs> um, special concerns, you know, a, a lot of our meat um, manure, it carries antibiotics. Not sure that you want that in your vegetable garden. Um, also attracts pests, E. coli, you know, you might have to deal with that. Herbicides in the case of, you know, putting treated plant material in there. Um, if you put it down, it takes a long time for some of these herbicides to break down. It's not gonna break down in your compost bin. It breaks down over time with sunlight, but it's not going to instantly break down in your compost bin. It will carry into your garden. Insect eggs and larvae, some of these insects have evolved to survive living in a desert, okay? Um, you're not going to be able to kill it in a compost bin. Anything that's odor causing, and then any plant diseases. So some of these herbicides, they don't completely degrade and you want to avoid putting anything that's been treated into your garden. You want to avoid these pesticides, these herbicides, because uh, it's not gonna break down. So the Goldilocks, and I, I named it that because you have it has to be just right, okay? So you need, you can get a thermometer if you want in order to track it. Me, I'm just happy with, I composted for a year, I have compost, it is what it is. But if you want to get it down, I want to compost every three months or so, go ahead and get a, a, a soil uh, thermometer. So 131 degrees is at 30, or at three consecutive days will kill off pathogens. When you bump it to 140, for three to five consecutive days, it'll kill off seeds, rhizomes, and stolons. You might find that you may not even reach 131 degrees. Um, at 150 to 160 degrees, that's great for killing off just about everything. Beneficial um, microorganisms and macroorganisms included. So, but like I said, you may find that you may not get up to 130. I have seen a very hot compost pile. I um, I had a um, tree service company drop some wood chips when I was working in West Virginia. I did not get the wood chips down in time. And all of a sudden I started seeing smoke out of the wood chip pile. So I had to just, you know, brush off the top, make sure some air got in there so I didn't start a wildfire. But something like that can get very hot. If you put, you know, you're not going to burn yourself or anything when you put it in there, but it feels good in the winter. Yeah. You just don't want to start a, 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 a wildfire. But if you do something like that, because you can't get a, a chip drop, sometimes I've just stopped them off on the on the road and say, hey, can you drop it off at this location? And they'll do it. Just make sure that you get it out and spread it out in time. Otherwise, it will start a fire. So make sure I'm good on time. Okay. I don't all right, so your, your pile will reach maybe about 140. You might get up to that 130. You may not. Depends on how often that you're turning. I'm not, I'm not reaching that 131. So any kind of plant disease materials does not go in my compost pile. So, oh, and another thing to highlight. So the materials on the outside may or may not reach those temperatures. So that's why you have to uh, turn it or use a pitchfork and you have to turn that material that's on the outside that's not being acted on and you have to get it on the inside and in about three to five days the micro microorganisms the macroorganisms they're going to um, 
oh, what's the word I'm looking for? They're going to max out on what they can do. So you have to turn it again so that it goes back up to 131 or whatever temperature, 140 that you're getting to so that they can start working again on that material. Three, five days, you turn it again. But like I said, my compost bin is lucky enough to do it once a week. So you have to constantly turn. So no coal or charcoal ash. No black walnut leaves, no twigs, no treated wood or anything like that. All that material um, that gets burned, that, um, you know, black walnut, they have hormones that prevent other plants from competing with it. So it won't even allow germination of other plants. If you go underneath the black walnut tree, you will find hardly anything growing under there. Not even its babies. It wants new competition. And and um, other plants in the family, they're going to send out hormones in order for germination to cease around it. That will carry. Um, any kind of treated wood, that's also going to carry. It doesn't break down. And so when you want that ratio, you want about 25 to 30 parts of carbon per one part nitrogen. And so I try to eyeball it as best I can because I just use my little shredder bucket and I kind of say, eh, yeah, that's about the amount of kitchen scraps that we need. I have one bucket and then I just constantly just throw carbon material in there until I reach about um, three to one pounds for each. OK, that's a lot of shredded materials. So beauty about it. I have Amazon boxes. I'm addicted. I'm sorry, but I just tear it up. Throw it in there, allow for more surface area, any kind of little paper. I have a good large pile of paper at work going and I just save material for the compost bin. So you want it into a three to one ratio. So these are some uh, example ratios. If, 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 you, if you just use pure carbon sources. Of course, there's a mixture that I'm doing, so I can't give you the ratio of what I'm doing, but I'm trying to do like a three pound to one pound ratio. But if you're going strictly with shredded newspaper, that'd be 170, uh, the ratio would be 170 to one carbon to nitrogen, straw, uh, just cardboard, et cetera. So it's going to dif differ um, unless you have um, just a hundred percent sawdust or a hundred percent, you know, uh, newspaper. I couldn't tell you what your ratio needs to be. I just throw in enough to where I make it look like there's about three to one and it works well. Anything with high uh, nitrogen content, um, you'll need to balance that out with your carbon source. So let's say you have just fresh grass clippings. You would need a 15 to one ratio of the carbon source to the grass clippings, okay? So again, really couldn't tell you because I have um, a lot going on. I have leaves, I do put in weeds, but they don't have seed heads on them or they don't have rhizomes or stolons. So that goes in, kitchen scraps go, go, go in, tea bags go in, coffee grounds go in. So you can see how muddy the waters can get with the ratio if you do it that way. So your lower, and I'm probably on the lower end, your lower C to N ratios, you're going to have quicker comp, uh, decomposition. If it's higher, it's going to be lower. Let's see. I want to make sure I got enough time and I don't know how many more slides I have. So assemble, assembling your compost pile. Let me make sure it's nothing important in here. Oh, this is the same slide. Sorry about that. Uh, so determine if it's okay first. See if you have the land. Make sure your municipality is okay with you doing a, a compost pile. Um, make sure that, you know, it's um, caged off if you have bears or something like that, because they're, they're going to come. They're going to sniff around and see what that smell is, because you, you have kitchen scraps in there. Of course, that's food that they can use. You want to make sure that it's okay. Make sure that you can turn it easily. I remember putting my compost bin at first in a corner, and I couldn't really use the, you know, the first one that I had, I really couldn't use a pitchfork to get in there to turn it. Um, it was awful. So I had to move it. 
Um, so make sure that it's easy to turn for you. You want to protect it from the wind and the sun. You also want to um, be close to your to your materials. The, the further away my compost bin is located, the less likely I'm going to go to it. All right. Um, even though the space is out in the middle of the yard or the back of the yard, it, it, it needs to be by the by the back door so I can just run out, throw my kitchen scraps in and come back inside. And then make sure it's out of direct view if necessary. Say that the location isn't OK and you miss municipality does it. Um, warranted or something like that, um, you know, don't do it. But maybe your neighbor may not like looking at it. Because neighbors are great, right? <laughs> um, just put it out of their direct view, okay? Because um, my neighbor now composts, I compost. Um, we have a large fen fence on the other side. My neighbor doesn't even know what's going on in our garden. Um, but make sure it's out, out of view. So again, if your municipality doesn't allow for it, but I don't know any municipality that does it allow for it. Um, but if your neighbors are having issues with it, make sure it's out of direct view. Make sure it's not bringing, uh, you know, mac mice or bear to the area. Then if it, if it was something going on like that, more pests were coming on site, I would get rid of my compost pile and then I would just buy it. So, if you do something in like, a, this is chicken wire. If you do something like this in chicken wire, um, the inches, and I, I measured them out, you have about a six inch brown layer, two inches of green layer, and then you'll have a two inch layer of soil or, or compost at the bottom there um, that's breaking down. And you wanna kind of just keep incorporating that until everything breaks down. At a certain point, you want to stop. I, and I had to get my husband on, on page with this because he would keep adding kitchen scraps to material that was already composted. And so now we have to start again because he turned it. And I wasn't going to sift through all the kitchen scraps that he, he put in there. So at some point you have to stop, make another one and start all over again to allow that first batch to get going. All right. So I do the cold pile method where, like I said, um, my pile is lucky if I turn it every two weeks or so, um, but I'll eventually get compost in a year or so. But like I said, if you do a, a fast, you're constantly turning, you're going to get that in about three to four months. So if it's too wet, you need to add more oxygen, okay? You just keep turning it. If it's too dry, your pile won't heat up. You need to add water. <laughs> You're not going to burn yourself, but if you are composting manure, you don't want to stick your hand in there. I think that's a, a given. Don't do it. <laughs> so turning helps incorporate the material that's one side and incorporates into the center. It also, it also incorporates oxygen. If you are in a position, say, like you have that cage and you can't exactly get a pitchfork in there or something, or you don't want to unravel it. Um, I have seen some people put a, um, what is it, perforated pipe, PVC with the holes in it um, in order to get oxygen down in the center there. So it can take anywhere between three to six months if you're on it. Me, I'm not on it. Um, so I get it in about a year. The center should be, you know, very hot. If it's very hot, you know, like that chip uh, pile that I had that I thought was going to catch on fire, um, you need to incorporate some air into that to make sure it doesn't start anything. And that end product should look like a dark brown um, hummus material. It should crumble and squeeze. It should smell like fresh oil or oil, soil. Um, if, it, if, it's, if it's not smelling like that, something is off. So using your compost is treated as a fertilizer. I spread it, you know, about an inch of compost over my containers. I couldn't tell you what the nutrient analysis of your, you know, compost is. Um, you would have to send that off to the lab, but that could get bit pretty expensive. Um, if you are doing it every three to six months. Uh, so, you know, it, it's going to be a great fertilizer. Just mix it in. It'll be fine. Uh, 
I did. And I will say my my husband finally did build a, a large screen for me. So I do put my compost through a screen. If you have just a ton of it, um, it's going to be excruciating work, but I do recommend it so that you can get out those large twigs, any kind of material that did not break down 100% um, so that it can go back into the compost pile. So I do recommend getting a large screen. That has been one of the, the best things um, that I use in my garden consistently in order to screen out any kind of big material. All right. And so just a ton of books. I didn't read all of them. I, let me be honest. I, I haven't read any of them. But these, these are some of the books that my master gardeners um, have compiled as and uh, other agents have compiled if you want more reading about composting. And then these were the actual sites that I did review and read in order to help build this um, presentation. But a lot of... Um, a lot of things I am working on my green thumb in order to um, to get used to composting. Hopefully, I'll get on that three month track. But um, really, like I said, every two weeks has been working for me. If I turn, if anything, it's just the microorganisms aren't working because it's no longer hot in the center. They'll they'll work when I turn it again. So it's not it's not devastating to the compost pile. All right, and with that. I will take any questions. Sorry, it was a little choppy at the end. I was just trying to fit everything in with the time that I had. Great. You think the paper takes longer to break down than anything else, or is it when you use the shredded timber? No, it it decomposes. Like I said, it decomposes slowly because I'm only turning every two weeks or so. Oh, I'm sorry. The question was, do I think the shredded paper breaks down more quickly than anything? Um, but let's see. Let's see what the science says. So I would equate it to the shredded newspaper. Um, I would just need a lot more. So it breaks down quickly, more quickly than anything on here. It, I just need a lot more of it. That's only that's the trade off. Yes. I knew, uh, you said something about putting the flyers, come in, petitions, you know, do those. Do you compost the ones that have color around them? So the question is, do I compost the flyers that had color with it? Absolutely. Really? Yes. Probably still never add that. Well, I do it the... It is my understanding that we have gone a little more environmentally friendly with the ink. Soy-based. Soy um, and to be quite honest, I don't have time to contact every single, you know, mailer that comes in to see what they do. And I'm just under the assumption that we have gone uh, to more something more environmentally friendly as far as ink. Say for her. For who? Vermiculture. Vermiculture. Um, I haven't had any problems. I would have to look into the research to see, but I haven't had any problems with it. Okay, because I have lots uh, red wigglers in a urban composter thing in the house. Yeah, I can only speak anecdotally from my perspective. I haven't had any issues with it. Okay, yes. Um, one solution to your problem about buying the tiller would be this new U fork that's out on the market. That you should stick in the ground and you pull back with your weight. Yeah, it's a broad fork yeah. is what you're referring to. Um, I repeat the question. So the the recommendation uh, for me in my battle with buying a tiller would be to buy a broad fork. And um, I have considered that. And the issue is... is Tools used to be a lot cheaper than the, the, I, when I price when I priced broad force, they were well up to eighty, a hundred dollars. And the tiller's cheaper on Amazon. I have found comparable prices with a coupon, of course. So I, I wait for things to go on sale with a coupon. Yes. 
But yeah, they're they're getting. I I would never have never thought a broad fork would cost so much because when I got into gardening, you know, tools would go on sale at Home Depot for like ten dollars, and I still have some of those tools. Not good tools. I still have them. They they are still in. They are still. If if you take care of your your uh, materials, they will work out. I, I learned that the hard way. I've I've purchased some gardening tools, but yes, the broad forks are expensive. Do they have some except within the vegetable garden mm -hmm. using it in uniform? Yeah, I will put that I will put that back in consideration. Yes. Yeah, yeah and I, I I don't want to mess up any microbes. And at the top, I don't want to mess up my current soil structure. Yeah. Yes. There's a question from the Zoomers about whether you have to pull off the cellophane windows from mail gondolas. Yes, I pull off any kind of plastic that is on paper. And at that point, if I'm doing it too much, then I just recycle it, to be honest. Because some of those Amazon boxes and um, some of the shipping boxes that I get, they're just loaded with tape. And I know in my municipality, they say tape is okay on boxes. And so sometimes I just recycle it. But it, it, but pull off the plastic if you're going to do that, because it, it'll be with you for 400 years at least. Question about banana peels, orange rinds, things of that nature. Um, are you putting that in compost as well? Or I am. You are. Okay. Yep. I, I try to break it down um, so that there's more surface area for the microorganisms to act on, but. You know, uh, sometimes I can't catch my husband in time in order for that to happen because he's not going to do it. Um, so I have to catch it, but it's been not, and it hasn't been a problem. Okay. And I learned last year, you just throw the whole thing in there. It, it works. Because I have a year. It may not work for you within three months. I have a whole year. Mm -hmm. One more question. I'm about to get the hook. <laughs> I would need to research on that. So the classic extension answer is I will look look it up and get back to you. But I, my assumption is that, yes, um, it would be a little acidic, but not too much for it to change your soil pH significantly. But I can get an official answer for you in, in email. Uh, someone about that or get your your contact information am i getting the hook i don't see me too i'm getting the hook thank you for inviting me out it's been a pleasure galen thank you for a very entertaining uh and uh informative uh presentation on composting i really enjoyed this a whole lot uh because some of us are sort of half city half country some urban so your experiences have been very yes oh stay there okay i wanted to tell galen i thought her presentation was very entertaining and informative uh because uh Composting is not necessarily a dry subject, but it can be a little icky subject. <laughs> so thank you so very much. Yes, thank appreciate you. it. Thank you for watching this presentation by the James City County Williamsburg Master Gardener Association. Please visit our website for more educational videos at jccwmg.org.